Just a quick thank you to everyone for attending our panel. Thanks so much to the conference organizers, and thanks so much to Dr. Taylor Isom and Taeyu Yang, who have given us this innovative concept of multi-imperialism to discuss during our panel. My name is Billy Noseworthy. I'm a visiting fellow at Cornell University and recording this live to tape. My presentation will focus on the city of four faces. The uh, founding of Kron Chotmok Sarai Mankun, of course, occurs in the 14th century, but along with the Latin Saigon, Phnom Penh is one of the most well-recognized French colonial urban projects in the history of Southeast Asia. We'll be looking at, in this presentation, a series of exogenous imperial forces and neo-imperial dynamics to consider whether or not Phnom Penh can be thought of as a multi-imperial city. I began this paper, the research for this paper, especially by thinking about the ways that multi-imperialism as a term might actually do the work that the term trans-imperial was trying to do. To do this, I had to puzzle through the term trans-imperial and think about trans-imperial dynamics and when they might make sense. For example, a trans-imperial dynamic or a trans-imperial moment can be seen when Son Diep, who is a Cambodian translator who worked with the de facto governor of Cambodia, Amonye, on the first dictionary, travels to Paris and creates a Khmer language travel account of Paris. This would be a sort of trans-imperial or a cross and empire connection. Banerjee, however, has suggested that the trans-imperial approach posits a relation of comparison, connection, and contiguity between different imperial constituencies. We could see this in Sondiep's example. How does this shape our understanding of the history of Phnom Penh? I think that we do not necessarily need to assume West-non-West -West dichotomies when we begin to think about trans-imperial connections. In some senses, they might be imposed or superimposed on the historical record in retrospect, um, in other cases, they might arrive to us from the original sources of the era. Nevertheless, uh, quite a number of scholars have begun to point out in the history of Southeast Asia that these dichotomies make less and less sense when we get into the interworkings of trans-imperial connections. Something else that trans-imperialism might do is it might deflect attention from the emphasis on flow and mobility, which might be advantageous when we're trying to dig into the everyday lives of local populations and emphasize indigenous production of ideas and concepts and so forth. However, what I like to think about is what else might multi-imperialism contribute to this discussion? Does it allow us to think, and I think it does, but does it allow us to think about these inter and intra-imperial relations, thinking about how they might occur in a single moment. So let's think about the 1950s or the 1960s in Phnom Penh, where we have an intersection of still latent remnants of French imperial connections, an overlay of Japanese previous imperial and neo-imperial dynamics intersecting with the impact of American imperial dynamics. The Kingdom of Cambodia is not just Cambodian, of course, but it's also sino khmer and there are Viet Khmer populations and just Vietnamese populations that are moved into Cambodia during the colonial period or sometimes even prior to the colonial period. And then, of course, you have the Cham community, the Malay community, or the Cham Malay community, commonly known as Jafia in Khmer. How might multi-imperialism also allow us to begin to think about the impact of the financial networks of the contemporary People's Republic of China or individuals from Malaysia or individuals from Thailand and the dynamics of the Cambodian and Thai relationship, especially with regard to the province of Battambang, but even in other parts of the country? I want to focus on three major monuments in downtown urban Phnom Penh, which scholars might think about as sort of recentering a new mandala of the city around the area of the downtown. 
On the left-hand side of the slide, you've got Vat Phnom, which traces its history to the 14th century story of Lady Dao Peng, yet the Wat itself was rebuilt several times in the 19th century, including during the French colonial period, and yet again in 1926. At the center of the slide, the Independence Monument is a monument constructed in the form of a traditional Khmer Prasat, but although the Declaration of Independence of Cambodia is in 1953, the monument is not officially inaugurated until 1962. Although it references this ancient Khmer temple of especially Bantai Srai, the monument is a very subtle modern reinvention. It incorporates traditional Khmer motifs by Master Batambang sculptor Tang Vut, who died in 1977. Another major architect of that period was Phan Molivan, who uh, was one of the key architects during the Sankum Ristonium. Prince Nordum Sinuk had acted a series of development policies encompassing the whole kingdom in a construction of new towns, infrastructure, and architecture, which would incorporate support from French, Japanese, and American firms. Van was one of the foremost of a generation of architects designing the so-called New Khmer architecture. He also designed the Olympic Stadium in the city. On the right-hand side of the slide, you have the Norodom Sihanouk Memorial, which was constructed after Prince Norodom Sihanouk, who later became King Norodom Sihanouk, was deceased. It's built right to the east of the Independence Monument, and it cost about 1.2 US million dollars to complete. Norodok Sinok had died in 2012 in Beijing, China, and is survived by his son and current king, King Norodom Siomuni, and his wife, Norodom Muniet. The statue is dedicated to Sihanouk's accomplishment on liberating the country in 1953 from French colonialism, but as we shall see, French colonialism continued to have an impact throughout the era that he was prominent. So moving quickly here, I just want to highlight some of the geography of the city. Troy Chungvan Peninsula is here um, on this tourist map. Bongkak Lake, which is later filled in, is here, and there's no mention of the Nagaland Casino, which is eventually constructed down here. This map is from 1990s, is or two, early 2000. In this 1937 map, we are depicting an extension plan of Phnom Penh that never happens. There's a proposed French quarter or a quartier européen over here on Shrui Chengvan with a public garden. And then you have a railway station proposed, which is eventually built, but you might note the proximity to Bongkak Lake, which I would argue prevents uh, Phnom Penh from being pulled upwards in this uh, north, northwesterly direction as the construction of a railway station might pull other um, imperial era cities away from their center along the waterfront, such as in the city of Chiang Mai, as Dr. Isom has previously argued. There are also uh, what are called Annamites or Vietnamese, Cambodian, and Chinese quarters on this map. What's notable, however, is that there is no reference to a Cham Muslim or a Cham Malay quarter, which had already existed on Chiroi Chiang Van at the time that the map was drawn. If we were to look into a 1942 plan of Phnom Penh, we might see the city expanding far southward into modern-day Tultumpong, and you might notice that there is a emergence of an X from an aerial photograph of the city, which is, of course, the famous Sautang Khmer, which is an art deco landmark of Phnom Penh, a bright yellow building that was constructed in 1937 with four tall arched roof arms branching out diagonally across the block, which begins to also recenter some of the geography of the city with the railway station built up here just to the south of Bongkok Lake. The new market begins to lead a massive growth of residential quarters just south of the lake and nearby the railway station. 
formerly known as the Gustav Eiffel Bridge or the Gustav Eiffel Bridge, if you're used to the American pronunciation. The Priamonivong Bridge is one of the busiest in Phnom Penh and it's built on the south side of the city. And you can see across these two maps from 1943 to 1958 that it really pulls some of the geography of the population further to the south in the city. The Japanese Friendship Bridge, located on the northern side of the city, connecting to the Churui Chengvan Peninsula, is only constructed, however, in the 1960s. Prior to the 1960s, this was still a boat ferry route. The bridge itself was built in 1963 to 1966 with Japanese aid. It was severely damaged during the Civil War in 1972 and 1973 and remained closed. Residents of Phnom Penh were evicted from the city by the rise of the DK regime or the Democratic Kampuchea regime forces on April 17, 1975, and therefore the Trui Trangvan Bridge in Phnom Penh was left without repair and had existing damages done by the war, just leaving it in a state of ruin for the next several decades. After the liberation on January 7th, 1979, a mixed population of provinces in city folks returned to live in Phnom Penh and the government began to restore infrastructure in the city. However, in the case of the Japanese Friendship Bridge, it was not reopened until 1994 when the government received a grant from the Japanese government to rebuild the bridge and the assistance of Japanese engineers to repair it. In the 1950s, the United States built National Road 4, the first of several international, including Korean, Japanese, and Chinese projects to impact the infrastructure of Cambodia. This National Road 4 was the highway from Phnom Penh to the then new port of Sihanoukville. The U.S. reconstructed the road in the early 1970s during the Lan Nol years, with Lan Nol being a U.S.-backed military regime in effect, and again in the mid-1990s. Prime Minister Hun said had lunch in Tokyo with Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, leading to the construction of a similar project, uh, National Road 5, so this was a relatively recent project, but these other national roads have all come through business relationships with Hunsen internationally. Phnom Penh International Airport was first built with French funds and engineers in 1957, and then inaugurated as Pontentong International Airport in 1959. However, in 1994, a 3,000 meter long runway was reinsured by Japanese MEADA firm. The runway was then constructed to be an additional 350 meters by a French company, uh, GTM. And there is both a series of rotating Japanese and French contracts that have supported the upkeep and the maintenance of this airport. In 2007, here moving to the filling in of Bungkok Lake, which uh, at first had Al Sirkal Mosque constructed on the north side of it with funds, especially moving from the Middle East. Then you have uh, in another firm, Shukaku Incorporated, which made a lease or, or made a lease agreement with the Cambodian government in 2007 for 99 years. The agreement resulted in the filling in of the lake with sand in order for the company to build condominiums and other complexes on the other side. The Nagaland Casino, pictured in an image here with an imagined expansion on the right-hand side of this slide, is in fact owned by Nagacorp LTD, which is a Hong Kong listed hotel, gaming, and leisure company. In its Cambodian property, Naga World is the lar country's largest hotel and gaming resort. Naga Corp holds a 70-year casino license in Cambodia, which will run into 2065, and has a monopoly within a 200-kilometer radius of Phnom Penh, except at the Cambodia-Vietnam border area, uh, where there is 
uh, another series of casino contracts, and also uh, Bokor and Kiroro Mountains and Sianukville. So Naga Casino first opened in 1995, and it was just on a boat moored in the Mekong River. But the casino moved to its current land-based facility in 2003. So this is an illustration, perhaps, of some of the new emerging multi-imperial or neo-multi-imperial dynamics of Phnom Penh as a city. So if we think about the moment when Phnom Penh is most clearly a multi-imperial city, I would argue based on the evidence that we should be looking especially at the 1950s through the 1960s and 70s where we have this overlay of French and American and Japanese dynamics as well as the post-war period from the 1990s through the 2000s, where we might be talking about neo-imperial dynamics, but especially a recombination of South Korean, Japanese firms, as well as those from Hong Kong, the PRC, and also Malaysia, as well as French and American firms, shaping the skyline and also the thoroughfares of this multi-imperial city. That's where I'll round off. Thank you, and I very much look forward to the discussion and the rest of the conference.